WNS, the white nose syndrome, and whenever it's discovered in a new location, generally see an article in the paper about it, has been confirmed, as I said, in Arkansas, Devil's Den, and Blanchard Cavern. Uh, those are two of the caves that it has been confirmed. Now, interesting, uh, they do still allow tours of Blanchard Cavern. Any of you who have been there <laughs> after it was discovered, it's kind of an interesting process you go through. You virtually can take nothing into the cavern. You can't take a purse, you can't take a wallet if you're a man, you have to take off your belt. Um, you uh, cannot take a camera, cannot take a cell phone. All that stuff has to be left outside. And then when you finish your tour, you have to put your feet in a kind of a Clorox Lysol solution for 10 minutes to make sure. But, you know, there's a purpose behind that. Uh, this is a cave mountain. Any of you are familiar with cave mountain? We have about 340,000 gray and Indiana bats, which are in our, our endangered bats in Arkansas in uh, the limestone area. And uh, they got a 10-foot iron fence, as you can see, around that whole cave area to keep you out. Uh, not all the caves are, are that well uh, protected, but uh, this one on Cave Mountain, Boxley Valley, they have that uh, around that cave, and that's been there for several years. Still allows the caves, uh, the bats are inside the cave to come out and go in, but no, uh, no human <coughs> activity. All right. I gotta hurry up a little bit. I'm getting to my hour. All right. Next thing I want to talk to you about uh, is Lake Jackson. And any of you are familiar with Lake Jackson? You probably are. It's a very nice lake, large lake in uh, uh, northern Tallahassee, Florida. Um, there have been a lot of uh, record uh, fish caught in that uh, lake. You can see a very pretty lake. There are a lot of homes around uh, that lake. Very gorgeous fishing spot. Uh, that's what Lake Jackson looked like in 1999. Uh, this is all Lake Jackson. That's what happened to it. Somebody pulled the plug. <laughs> all right, just like a bathtub, right here. It completely emptied right down into that little hole or big hole. Okay, happens about every 10, 15 or so years. Lake Jackson. They were not, I mean, how'd you like to have a home there? You know, and all of a sudden you don't have a lake. Uh, just completely opens up and disappears. Uh, and this is kind of a, a cross section. Um, with a, it's a quarter sink is the is the culprit. That's a sinkhole. And here here would be the lake up here, and it just goes down. That opens up and it goes down. Yeah, and it just disappears, just like a bathtub having its plug pull. Um, and what do they have to do? Well, they have to plug up the hole. It doesn't do it naturally. You know, they have to put this ground and all everything they can bring in to, uh, to cover up the hole. And eventually it works. And that was uh, Lake Jackson about four years ago when I was there. So that was from 1999 until about, uh, about 2009. It took about 10 years, you know, for it to... And it'll stay like that for a while, and then it will disappear again. You know? But that's what happens uh, again in a uh, in a karst in a um, uh, limestone environment because it is always disintegrating. And uh, even though they plug a hole, that limestone around it will continue to disintegrate and will open up again. How so fast did it drain? Pretty fast, as you can imagine. Uh, I mean, it. Uh, I'm trying to think of the time period, but it was like within three months. Something like that. It's been completely, completely drained. You get a lot of free fish then? <laughs> yeah. You know, see what the bottom is. is like. <laughs> All right, a spring. Uh, Blue Spring, which is one of the uh, more interesting springs we have in this area outside of uh, Eureka Spring, uh, is a natural spring. And again, this is something that is caused by that karst environment. Remember, I showed you that picture. You have water coming down through the limestone. Eventually, it hits uh, rock that is not limestone that it can't go through. And so what it does is starts it's flowing. Well, it'll flow, keep flowing until it hits another type of rock that it can't go through. And what does it do? It comes back up to the surface. That's kind of a simple explanation, if you can follow me, of what forms a spring. Uh, now, Blue Spring, is, the spring itself is right here. This is the head, well, headwaters, what I call the spring. It goes way down. Um, and uh, Blue Spring is, let's see, I got the statistic here, 38 million gallons of water a day. 38 million gallons of water come up from the ground a day, uh, right through here, and it goes out into the White River. 
So it, it, it flows basically from back here, through here, and just clear water. It's kind of hard to see these pictures, but you can just see down to the bottom of the water, and then it has a little dam here, flows over, and that's what goes out to the White River. That's Blue Springs. The mouth of that cave is um, the mouth of the cave which the water comes from. They've set divers down there is about three feet wide. And they have explored down to 218 feet. And they anticipate it goes down at least 500. Mm. You know, so it's a deep, deep spring underground there at, uh, at Blue Spring. Another spring we have, uh, we have several. Uh, this is in Missouri, Roaring River State Park. Again, you might know one of my favorite state parks. But the spring actually is way back in here. Uh, but this is what, uh, you know, causes this lake where they have the trout hatchery and then the Roaring River, you know, comes right out of, of spring, spring water. Fascinating place. Mammoth Springs. Have you ever been to Mammoth Springs? It's north of Hardy on the Missouri border over yes. on the eastern part of the state. Uh, they have a spring there, of course, and there's the spring. It discharges 80 feet uh, below the water surface, 9 million gallons of water per hour. Now remember that other spring, Blue Spring, I said, was, what, 38 million gallons of water a day. This is 9 million gallons of water. And you can see it is pouring out of there. You know, this is where it's overflowing. The spring itself is right in this area. Uh, and it also creates a, uh, a river. And I forget the name of it. The spring, spring river. river. The spring river. Yeah. Spring river. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I got it. It discharges into the spring river. All right. This is another spring. And this spring is over 2,000 years old. This was in Megiddo, Israel. I'm just fascinated by this. This is probably about. 20 feet by about 10 feet, uh, and it's water. <laughs> the water is about two feet deep. You can see how clear it is. Uh, you can't even tell. But that's been around for at least two to three thousand years that they know about. You go down this deep, steep stairway to uh, to get to it underground. You can see the, the limestone covering all above it. That's <coughs> All right. Two more things, but this will be quick. One is disappearing uh, rivers, losing streams. They, they have a different name. Probably losing stream is the most popular. And you can see why they call it that. You've got this body of water that's a creek or a stream or a river, probably you know, caused by heavy rain recently. And then it just it goes down into this rock and literally it disappears. You know, here's another example. You have this long water body here and it's dropping down into here. And it, it doesn't fall out here. It just keeps going down into that limestone rock. Now, we have one near us here uh, out at uh, Hop State Park, Little Clifty Clif Clif Creek, um, by the Van Winkle uh, historic area. Um, you can see, and these aren't real good pictures, but as I come up with you, you can see here's part of the Clifty Creek coming alongside these rocks, and then it just disappears. You don't see it along that riverbed at all. Um, and this is, again, just the riverbed toward this bridge that crosses the creek. And here's where it comes out again. So it completely goes underground for a period of time and then comes out. That's what a losing stream is. Uh, part of the Buffalo River, believe it or not, uh, is uh, a losing stream, uh, which I found interesting. If I can find my page here, I'll tell you where it is. Anyway, before I get to that, Montezuma Well, remember I showed you um, that uh, early uh, Indian dwelling by Phoenix. Uh, this is just down the road called Montezuma Well, again in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, some real early, you know, Indian or Native people uh, dwelling um, in that limestone. This is out in the middle of a desert, all right, middle of a desert. And you talk about a, uh, you know, a losing a losing stream. Um, it's a sink. It's a kind of a funnel-shaped sink, uh, about an hour out of uh, out of Phoenix. The pool of water is about 55 feet deep, so that is very deep. Um, the well is about a million and a half gallons of water a day that creates this little sink or uh, lake. Um, and there are th they know there are three vents that 
cause the spring water to come into the, uh, the lake. It maintains an average temperature of 76 degrees year round. But what's interesting about it is, and you might guess where the water flows out of this area. And where does it flow out? You can see. I mean, here's all the, the, the only vegetation. So it flows out right through here. And it flows out underground. Here's it coming in. And that is a very narrow area. That's probably about two feet wide where that water flows from the spring water that's fed into that area. And it goes under the uh, under this hill or mountain or limestone rock formation, whatever you call it. And it goes under it for about uh, 800 feet. And it comes out, actually that's where it comes out. There's where, <laughs> there's where it goes in, there's where it comes out. And it comes out into an area that was for, uh, runs for about a mile. And it was used by some of the early uh, habitants of the area for farming. It used as an irrigation source, but that is all spring water, all natural, natural spring water. Okay, the last thing we're going to talk about, blue holes. What's a blue hole? Have you ever been up in an airplane flying generally you know, to the Bahamas or the eastern coast of Florida, uh, and you look out, you might see something like that. Uh, this, of course, is you know, nothing but a big slab of limestone. And there are often sinkholes in that limestone. When, it, when you have a sinkhole, that's what it forms. And they're called blue holes, very deep caverns that have been caused by the action of the, of the water. Uh, this is a different one. As you can see, look at the size of that. Here's a you know, rather large, couple of large boats into that area. Very black. Why is it black? Dark? Because it is deep. There's another one. We're closer to a beach. Here's the first one on the beach. But they're, they, and they're called blue holes. Found, as I said, anywhere you have limestone environment, primarily off the east coast of Florida, though, in that area. There's no one close to land. National Geographic, and I, I use this only because it was, they had an interesting article a couple of years ago on blue holes where they were explored. This is what it looks like if you went down into, you know, it's a cave. Nothing more than a, a cave. It can be a very dangerous place, as you can imagine, to, uh, to explore. Um, but those are the blue holes that are found all over the, um, uh, the Bahamas. And that's the end of the road. <laughs> <laughs> what do they say? If you can't see the bottom of the road, don't go over it. Anybody have any questions? Yeah. Well, I'd like you to address the situation um, with the Buffalo River and the hog farm on Big, on Big Creek and the consequences that's going to happen when that lagoon turns into a sinkhole like this. Let me tell you my involvement with that, because I had some early involvement. Uh, and i got to go back a little bit now. Anybody has to leave, please feel free to leave. I understand it's almost quarter after, but this is, is kind of an interesting story. Um, the last thing I did before I left Florida for years, I was with the Attorney General's office there handling litigation. And uh, I handled environmental litigation, among others, we really didn't have an environmental section. And anybody that's familiar with the northern part of Florida or where Tallahassee is knows that that is a, a very interesting karst uh, terrain. About 20 miles south of Tallahassee is a place called Wakulla Springs. It's a class number one spring if you've ever seen it. It's a gorgeous spring. They have electric boat tours there and all kinds of wildlife. Some of the Tarzan movies were filmed there. Airport 3 or something was filmed there under the spring. Anyway, Wakulla Springs was suffering from uh, a lot of growth of hydrilla. And if you know anything about hydrilla, uh, it is caused by an overabundance of nutrients, generally nitrogen, in the water. Uh, they suspected that it was coming from a spray field, which the city of Tallahassee used uh, for their uh, wastewater sewage treatment. They had a spray field, which any of you know, are you familiar with spray fields? Just a large area where they spray water, you know, over. Well, but you had a karst environment. So they suspected that that water, that polluted water, was going through the, the um, karst environment, the limestone, into underground caves, which were all kind of down into Buffalo Springs. But how do you prove that? Well, simple. You get the USGS to do a dye trace study, okay? They put in dye trace. Two and a half weeks later, it showed up at Wakulla Springs. So we had the cause and we had the effect. What do you do about it? Well, ironically, the permit to operate the wastewater treatment plant for the city of Tallahassee was coming up for renewal. Mm -hmm. All right? 
The Attorney General's Office filed a lawsuit against the City of Tallahassee and the Department of Environmental Protection challenging the rule, claiming that they were polluting the area. To make a long story short, got a lot of favorable publicity from the newspaper, local newspaper, citizens and everything. And those two entities finally came to us and said, can we sit down and, and we'll talk about settling this case? They agreed at that time, and that was just before I left Florida in 2008, to a $160, $160 million advanced wastewater treatment upgrade <coughs> uh, over six years to bring the nitrogen from 12 parts per billion, which it was, down to three parts per billion. Okay? So when this hawk farm thing started coming up, I had somebody contact me, and I said, <coughs> you know, you're talking about the permit and whether it should have been issued and whether notice was given and whether people had a right... Forget about it. It's already been issued. What you've got to do is show that there's a reason why you should challenge this operation. And the easiest way to do it is get somebody to do a dye trace study. See if that hog farm affluent flows into the Buffalo River. You're speculating it will. My thought is it, it will. You're not talking about 20 miles like in Tallahassee. You're talking about several hundred feet and a much steeper you know, terrain. At the time, they weren't interested in that. They wanted to challenge the permit and everything. I said, okay, good luck. Well, what happened eight months later, you know, they hired this guy <laughs> to do a dietary study, which is still ongoing, and the whole process is ongoing. Actually, recently I read that they're having mixed results from the testing that has been done. There's two groups that are doing testing there, um, uh, you know, and they're not getting anything uniform as to whether the affluent from the, the hawk farm operation is adversely affecting the Buffalo River. Now, I haven't seen the results of any study about the, the you know, dye trace about it going into the river, but I think that's kind of accepted now as a, as a foregone conclusion that, you know, yeah, it can eventually go into the river, but what effect is it having on the river? And that's the key thing. I mean, you have to show that it's polluting the river o over certain standards. So that's kind of a long answer to your, you know, to your question. Well, but recently there was an article in the paper like, within the last week that the funding is starting to run out on one of the projects. Um, not, thank goodness not the dye trace, but the other one. Um, as far as the monitoring, it's supposed to be monitored for five years, and they're only into the second year now. So they're looking for more funding to keep that monitoring uh, going. Well, and you know the court case was judged on uh, about a month or two ago now that uh, the ADEQ did not do their job at all yeah. and our group won yeah. the court and how that's going to affect shutting them down hopefully I don't know but we did win. Yeah, it's going to be very difficult and almost impossible at the present time to shut them down and such so you've got to stop your operation. You know. Um, I don't see the next significant factor being until the permit comes up for renewal. And then hopefully when it comes up for renewal, and I don't know what the renewal process is in Arkansas, whether it's five years or how long it is, but at some point that permit that they got from you know, ADEQ is going to come up for renewal. And then I think you're going to have a lot of activity, which possibly should have taken place at the beginning. Um, another question. No question? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, on the same topic, uh, evidently there was no way to predetermine or warning signs or anything like that because of the of all that. I've heard that that is not necessarily true, and I've heard that if you're thinking of building a home, you know, uh, definitely on top of what you know is karst, you know, and maybe there's even a. You remember, and that to kind of get away from it. You remember several years ago, in fact, when I first moved here, because my son is a prosecutor here in Washington County, the Washington County Courthouse was building a new parking deck. Mm -hmm. And they got halfway through the parking deck, and all of a sudden they had to stop because they found one or two caves underneath the parking deck. And whoa, you know, this whole thing could collapse. And they had to redesign and refigure. Well, supposedly, you know, if you're going to build anything in this type of environment, you should have a study done. Uh, and it can be done as to what's under, you know, what's underneath it. You know, is it solid for several hundred feet, which is pretty good, or is it solid for maybe 20 feet, and then all of a sudden it opens up into a cave. I mean, we got caves all over the place here in Northwest Arkansas, and you don't want to build on a piece of property that has a, you know, which maybe has some substance to it, but then that could disintegrate, and you're down into a cave. So there is a way 
you know, by, stu by environmental and engineering studies to determine what is under the area where you're going to, to build, which I've been told is, is you shouldn't build a house here without doing that because of what can happen. Mm -hmm. Did that answer your question? Yeah, kind of. Okay. Yes, sir. What are the chances of Beaver Lake draining due to carts? <laughs> <laughs> um, very, I, I think slim and none. Uh, I mean, you think of what the way Beaver Lake was constructed. You know, Beaver, you know, that, the history of Beaver Lake is underneath the lake. Um, the the roads that people rode their horses on and their carriages and got around were you know it was it was solid ground for the most part underneath the, the Beaver Lake but with the White River impacting it uh, big time and I'm not aware of anybody coming up with hey a gigantic sinkhole you know in this location on Beaver Lake it's possible certainly is possible um, but you don't have the same situation at least it hasn't been discovered that you had with Lake Jackson where over a period of years it has drained several times. You know, they've never had that problem with, with Beaver Lake. And I would think it would show up by now. Beaver Lake was finished in 1966. That's when the lake was filled up. We started construction in 1960. 1966 it was finished. They've never had a problem with, you know, water draining out in any area. Yeah. You know that liquefaction effect after earthquakes is the opposite of shingle, right? I mean, the water comes to the surface after the agitation of an earthquake. Is that just because okay. it's not limestone? I'm not that familiar with that, so okay. I just I, I, I don't want to address related, that. You know, it's water coming up as opposed to yeah. Well, to me, it would be similar to what causes a spring, though. Right. Right. You know, a spring comes up. Yeah. Spring is flowing, flowing. All of a sudden, it hits rock and stop limestone. Mm -hmm. It can't go through. Yeah. It's got to go somewhere. It's running up. So it comes up to the surface. That's how we get our springs. Does it just hold all properties just having these ginormous puddles after an earthquake? So it's just yeah. Okay. I'm just not familiar with that. Probably Sorry. not forest material. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, you were talking about Mammoth Springs. Did you go north of there for what they call the Grand Canyon of, and I don't know if it's from Missouri or the Midwest, but it was an underground river that they think may have fed or helped the Mammoth Springs, but the Top has collapsed, so you, it's a park. That you can walk I've heard about that. I heard about it after I went to Mammoth <laughs> Spring, unfortunately. Uh, uh, yeah, it sounds very interesting. It is neat out there. Yeah, they have a lot. In fact, I had a map on my PowerPoint and I took it out because I just didn't care that much for it. I probably should have left it in. But it shows all of the um, um, sinkholes and a lot of disappearing streams in Missouri, and there's a lot of them. There is a lot, a lot more than in Arkansas, mm -hmm. yeah, and because that's you know that's where the main body of the Ozarks uh, are. Yes, ma'am. If you have a first water table and you have a drought period in which the you know the water level drops way down, is there a chance of a sinkhole developing there in that area? Sure, there's always a chance when you lose that support, you know, from the from the ground. That's what, when you have plenty of water, the water's holding up, you know, and, and a lot of power in, in water. Uh, but when that starts dropping, depending on what's on top of it, you know, could cause a uh, could cause a sinkhole. Yeah. And depending on what kind of water is dropping into the air, if you have a depressed area, like I showed you that one sinkhole in Hop State Park, where you just tell them when it rains, that water just comes right down, you know, into the mountain, it's going to accumulate in that area. That's what you don't want. You don't want that kind of accumulation of of water. If the water drains off into another area, then you're probably all right. But if it's accumulating into an area, it can, yeah. Remember, I call this disappearing ground, and that's what happens. It just gives way. Yeah, the, uh, there's an area, I live in an area, on the University Stadium, but one of the branches is on the hill, and that's the first one the table. Yeah. And the water level has been dropping um, for the last several years. And, uh, just Could be an indication of that. Of that, that water is going yeah. somewhere. It's going yeah. somewhere. Yeah, it's yeah. going somewhere. Uh, and, and you're losing your support when it is, you know, draining away like that. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all very much. I really enjoyed this again. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
handouts out there. Think about the Master Naturalist program also. Like I said, it starts February 21st. If you're interested, uh, you can sign up uh, online. Fascinating course. Uh, it covers everything. Uh, that's you know, not everybody's interested in the same thing. I'm not that interested in birds. I like learning about them, but I am certainly not a bird.